a genomicist um, and uh, I study human and medaka fish. Um, and I'm actually not that close to the cancer field. So I'm a chair here in ignorance with, uh, with many of you and looking forward to this panel um, discussion. And I think first off, we should just uh, go around the virtual table. Um, uh, it could, I'll point to each of you, uh, say your name. You can introduce yourselves, just give a little, a little uh, tiny view of your expertise here. So starting with you, uh, David. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, so I'm uh, David Crosby. I'm the Head of Prevention and Early Detection Research at Cancer Research UK. Uh, Cancer Research UK is a fundraising medical research charity um, who uh, support research across the entire spectrum of uh, cancer research and care, um, uh, but with a strong strategic interest in how we find cancers early and therefore treat them more successfully. Perfect. And then Claire? Hi, uh, my name's Claire Turnbull. I lead a research team um, at the Institute of Cancer Research in the Division of Genetics and Epidemiology, focused on cancer predisposition. Um, but I also have um, honorary appointments um, as a consultant in clinical genetics at the Royal Marsden Hospital and um, a consultant in public health medicine at Public Health England. Perfect. Uh, Saskia? Hi, I'm Saskia Sanderson. I'm the Chief Behavioural Scientist at Our Future Health. Our Future Health is a, a major new research programme across the UK where we're recruiting up to 5 million adults um, to provide a resource to improve earlier detection um, uh, and prevention and earlier treatment of diseases. Um, my, I lead the behavioural science team at Our Future Health uh, and my own background is as a psychologist. I'm a chartered psychologist, uh, um, uh, have a background in health psychology applied to genomics. Um, so I particularly have uh, spent my career doing research looking at the human aspects of people getting genetic and other kinds of information about themselves um, and looking at that from a psychological and behavioural perspectives. And finally, Peter. Good evening, I'm Peter Sassini, I'm Professor of Cancer Prevention at King's College London and Director of their Clinical Trials Unit there. Um, my background is in statistics, uh, but I have been doing cancer screening research for some 30 years. I chair the National Cancer Research Institute's um, Screening Prevention and Early Detection um, group, and I should declare a conflict of interest in that I'm on the Scientific Advisory Board for GRAIL. Uh, which is a company that makes a, a blood test that is looking for multiple cancers from a single draw of blood. Yes, and at the same time, I should actually de declare my other COI, my conflict of interest, which I'm a shareholder and consultant for with Manipur that makes DNA sequencing machines. I don't know if there's any other conflicts around from, from the, other, the other three of you. No, that's great. So this is wonderful, and I think we should start off... Um, uh, Claire, and then perhaps Dave, really about setting the scene about screening. So screening, I think, can mean a lot of different things to people. And there's also this sort of uh, business between often using genetics and genomics from the germline, really risk stratification versus screening, which is really trying to detect cancer. So can you just give us the 101 about what we're talking about here? When we're talking about screening, what are we talking about? Yeah, thank you. And, and I think um, we, we had in our pre-discussion um, ahead of this meeting, we were jumping between the two. And that was why we really felt it was important to lay out up front for, for clarification. So screening is typically meant looking for whether you have the disease here today. So cancer screening, uh, there are three screening programs as uh, breast, colorectal and cervical cancer. They are testing or ex um, examining whether you have the respective cancer. So for screening, we use technologies like imaging for breast cancer, uh, cytology, looking for abnormal cells for cervical cancer, and looking for substances released by or on account of the tumour. So fit testing for bowel cancer. And so fit that's testing means... It's Talk people through fit testing in case they don't know. <laughs> um, so fit fit testing is looking for blood in the stool. So it, that that's what the test is, and that's that's a marker of of of, of a tumor being there. So th those are the types of technologies we use to look for cancer. 
There is also risk stratification, which is quantifying your likelihood of developing cancer at any point in the future. And for that, we largely use your constitutional genetics, so it doesn't change over your lifetime. Um, and from that, you can be put into sort of bands of risk. There are non-genetic lifestyle factors which can be woven in. So, for example, for breast cancer, you can do a risk score that also includes your body mass index and some hormonal factors which can be you can be added to your genetic factors and that could put you in the kind of top 20 percent or the bottom 20 percent of risk so those are two very separate concepts but of course if you are going to undertake a risk stratification it is logical that you're doing it for a reason it's logical that you would only undertake it if you're going to do something to that top 10% or top 20%, which is different to what you do to the rest. So you might possibly want to give them a drug, you might want to give them a statin in regard to cardiovascular disease or aspirin or whatever. You may possibly undertake some preventative surgery if they're at higher risk. And we, we do in other circumstances advocate preventative removal of the breast or ovaries for people with, for example, BRCA1 and 2 mutations. But largely, I think the model would be that you give those people in the top band of risk some form of screening over the next 10, 20, 30 years that you are not going to give people in the bottom bands of risk. And therefore it's really important that when you're thinking about risk stratification, that you have to line it up with the type of screening that you're proposing for the disease in question, because they really come as a package, as a pair, um, and, and think of it as a system. So you've got the risk stratification, the screening test, and the confirmatory test is your sort of workflow. And the proposal would be that you're gonna use your risk stratification and offer some form of screening at, at, over the next X years because these people are at higher risk. Yeah. So I'll stop so, talking now, but I hope that sort of sets the That was the wonderful. Scene. And I, I actually want to, to get, because I know you have a good story about testicular cancer uh, here as, a, as an example, but Peter, that you already wanted to come in and, and uh, provide a little bit of colour. Yes, yes. So, so I say agree with everything Claire said. As is often the case, things are not quite so simple. So there's a, a, a grey line. Um, so, for instance, in cervical screening, we're not really screening for cancer. We're screening for a pre-cancer. And in fact, when we're looking for HPV infection, um, that will often tell you about your future risk of getting cervical cancer. It's not something that we treat. So we, the first test that is done is to see whether a woman has an HPV infection at the time or not. If that, if she does, we then do a, a second test to look for disease that is present then and could be treated. But if she doesn't, she remains at higher risk than a woman who doesn't have. And in breast screening, although we're primarily looking for a cancer and that's all that's done in this country in the US they would also look at the mammogram and say there are the, the, the your breast looks dense there's more of a certain type of tissue and that puts you at higher risk of breast cancer in the future even though there's no suggestion you have breast cancer now so the screening and the risk stratification can get horribly complicated and mixed together Still, I, I do think those extremes are, are very good. And, and Claire, I just want to go back because I, I was always been struck by this example of testicular cancer. So talk us through testicular cancer in this, in this risk stratification framework. And then I'm going to go and, and talk about why we do screening totally to Dave. So get ready, Dave. Um, and uh, not both why we do it and what we have to watch out for in the future. But Testicular cancer first, please, Claire. Yeah, so I just, I, I think it's one I, I often mention and um, in my um, research gene discovery activity, we focused on testicular cancer and it is actually one of the most heritable of the, of the sort of more common-ish cancer types. Um, and it has this uh, genetic, epidemiolo genetic em epidemiology shows it to be highly heritable. There's high familial risks. We started doing our GWAS and we got these you know, relatively high hits. Uh, we've pulled together the polygenic risk score. We have an AUC of about 0.85, which blows all other cancer types out of the park. And there's lots of talk of, are we ready for prime time? It, this looks like a really good risk stratification tool. But you can't just look at the risk stratification in isolation. You have to look at 
how common is this cancer? And actually testicular cancer only has a lifetime risk of one in 200 for men. So it's pretty rare. Um, how how important is this a significant public health problem? And actually testicular cancer overall has a 10 year survival of over 95%. It's one of the triumphs of modern chemotherapy. It's very treatable. Largely, we detect it quite early and it responds beautifully to chemotherapy. So actually, there has been no rationale ever for developing a robust screening tool. So this is this is something that's pretty rare. So even if we, we know that if we take those in the top 5% of risk, they have about a five-fold elevated risk, but they still only go from one in 200 to one in 40. So that's not that useful. And what would we offer them? Because we don't know any screening that works. And they're still at only one in 40 um, percent, uh, one in 40 level risk of something that really has a very, very good prognosis. So again, it's it's thinking of those broader mm -hmm. um, elements around the disease and not just looking at that AUC as, as a number in isolation. Perfect. I think this flips and we go to Dave now about why do we do screening programs? I mean, not for testicular with, with we could do risk stratification, but we wouldn't do screening. But maybe colon cancer, why is it so important that we do screening pro programs? What, what is the benefit of a well-executed screening program? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, I mean, it's pretty fairly intuitive to everyone, but bears stating that when we catch cancer very early, um, when the tumour is very small and it's localised, it hasn't spread, uh, the chances of successful treatment are much, much higher. If we don't find a cancer, if we don't diagnose it until it's at its later stages, what, we, what you might call stage four, when it's spread around the body, it's metastasized, um, then the chances of survival tend to be very low. So if you look at colorectal cancer, for example, um, when that's caught at its earliest stage, stage one, localized, uh, more than 90% uh, of people will survive that disease. If we diagnose it at stage four when it's spread all around the body, um, the chances of survival are less than 10%. I mean, you know, that that's, is a huge, that is a huge, absolutely huge yeah. difference. It's a really yeah. stark difference. And so, and then the reason for that um, is, is uh, early cancer is, is treatable predominantly because if it's in a single site, it hasn't spread, um, you know, surgery can, can remove the lesion in, in many cases. Um, but also the, the more advanced the cancer is, not only has it spread around the body, but it's also uh, diversified. You know, cancers evolve as they grow. They don't just stay as one type of cell. So, you know, if you're applying a drug treatment, for example, on an early cancer, you've got a pretty good chance that the cancer will be susceptible. A late cancer that's evolved and has many different cell types, only some of those cells might be susceptible to the drug. And then I think, you know, that is a real... Um success story and a rationale for screening and I'm going to get my colon screened as soon as I can and, and everything else. Um, mm. But we've also had worldwide and, and in different places kind of the, the, the bad side of screening, right? For example, in, in prostate would be your classic. So talk us through the harms also. What, sure. what, what can go wrong when we run screening programs? What, yeah. what, is, the, what is the danger of mm. screening? I mean, so, so again, it, it's, it's intuitive that, you, you know, well, if, if uh, you're catching it early is, is a good thing, then screening must be a good thing. You know, you pick up all this early disease, brilliant, cure people. Uh, and that is the upside. The, the downside is that cancer, um, despite the fact that, you know, one in two of us uh, will be affected by cancer in our lifetimes, uh, in terms of its actual incidence, it's relatively rare in the general population. So what that means is, you know, if I'm going to screen a thousand people to find, uh, you know, 10 cancers, I'll save those 10 people, but no test is perfect. So in screening those thousand people, uh, even if my test is, uh, you know, 99% accurate, I'm still going to misdiagnose 10 people. And so I'm going to subject those 10 people to follow up investigations, to psychological stress and anxiety. Uh, and potentially even harm, you know, if I decide, oh, actually, now I need to go in and, you know, perform exploratory surgery on them. So there's a, there's attendant risk um, with screening. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, we often think about misdiagnosis as, as a kind of mistake by the screening or, or by the doctor. But I think it's actually, in many ways, you could call it mischaracterization or 
or understanding what the cancer is and to just explain the prostate cancer scenario which i think is really sure, really sure. a telling uh, <laughs> scenario here yeah yeah so, so th this is the this is the other problem um that the early detection and diagnosis faces is that not every uh cellular change and not every cancer is going to kill you um and uh if you screen people um, so this this happens with uh, can happen with prostate cancer. It also happens with um, thyroid cancer is the other sort of story. In mm -hmm. in South Korea, they um, through through epidemiology, they noticed that a lot of people um, were dying with thyroid cancer. Uh, you know, finding it on post mortem, and so they thought, crikey, there's a there's an un, there's a hidden epi uh, epidemic of thyroid cancers. So we need to start screening for it. So they screened for it. They picked up tons of early thyroid cancers. Uh, they treated them all and it didn't change anyone's survival one bit. And the reason for that is those thyroid cancers were very slow growing. They weren't particularly aggressive. And so these people were reaching old age, dying of something else. Uh, that thyroid cancer just happened to be there. Mm -hmm. So um, not every cancer is aggressive, lethal. Not every cancer is going to kill you before you die of something else. So yeah. you need to think about the balance of risk and benefits in treating those indolent lesions. I mean, I've heard from a from a prostate cancer biologist, this rather depressing quote, which is that all men will get prostate cancer. The question is, is do you die uh, before the prostate cancer grows? Uh, um, there? So that is, um, it, it really is quite complicated and why there's so much stats and thoughts uh, behind this. Now, I think the reason why we're here is we're seeing uh, an explosion of technology in both of these areas, in risk stratification and in the screening processes. So what we measure for screening. And um, Peter, this may be a chance for you to just sketch out why you're excited about the clinical trial around GRAIL happening in the UK at the moment, because that is one of these new technologies. But let's try to uh, generalize that a little bit beyond that one trial. What are the new opportunities for screening, and we might come back to risk stratification uh, coming up in the future. I think the yeah in the past we were thinking about screening for one type of cancer at a time, and that meant that we could only think about screening for the more common cancers. There was no point in thinking about doing a special screening program and and the interventions for cancers which were less common, um, and so. We've had the same three screening programs for around 30 years in this country, and we're just about to introduce a fourth screening program, lung screen. So that was the, that's the one change that we, we're now thinking about doing screening for several cancers all at once. The other change is that, you know, as Claire said, the screening has been based either on imaging, you know, can you get, can you get to see somehow the cancer before it's causing problems when it's quite small, either using x-rays or CT scans or possibly MRI, um, or getting little bits of a, a pre-cancer or little bits of the cancer, um, mostly sort of trying to access it directly. So um, the cervical screening is, is taking cells from the cervix. Um, uh, bowel screening is getting the feces which have passed through the the bowel and saying you know will they have picked up cells we can now look for signs of the cancer in in the stool so what's different now is that we're saying we think we can look in the blood for instance or other people will be looking in in breath exhaled air um, for signs of cancer and those signs are very generic so it's potentially you can say there's cancer that immediately causes a second problem. Well, okay, we think this person has cancer. Where on earth is it? And so the, you know, the, the test which we're doing a trial of, the, the, the one that's called the gallery test made by a company called Grail, um, and the NHS are evaluating that in a big clinical trial. That is the, the, uh, the result of the test comes in two parts. First of all, it says, do we think this individual has cancer? Yes or no. And if they have cancer, it tries to say within 20 different um, sites within the body, this is where it should be. And possibly here's a backup site. 
Uh, and then you'd have to go and investigate at each site separately. So those, the potential to do that, which has been built on the back of this huge advances in um, molecular biology and in artificial intelligence, because what you're doing with that test is essentially doing genome-wide sequencing and then having to put those, if you like, half a million different results from that one uh, blood sample together in a useful way to give something that's clinically meaningful. Yeah. And I think for some people, um, just talk us through uh, or, or stress here, obviously this is not just blood cancer. I mean, blood cancer is kind of the, the, the kind of easy one in this situation. Um, and you're really talking about this shedding of, of small bits of DNA from tumors, right? So, so talk about why, why the company is so confident that this trial is worth doing, and then maybe reflect a little bit, you know, what, what do you think could be the harms here? And, and you know, the, the evaluation, what, what, are the, what are the possible, there's some great outcomes, but what are some, what are some of the other outcomes that, that you might be thinking about? So I've got Peter and then I've got Claire. Saskia, I'm definitely going to come to you, so don't, don't worry about that. So Peter, go first on that. Yeah, so, so just a tiny bit on the history. So, so we already use very similar technology in antenatal screening. Mm -hmm. And so the, the idea there is that even though the, the mother's blood supply and the, the, the fetus's blood supply are completely separate, little bits of the fetus, those some cells die, they break down and they get into the mother's blood. And so we're doing antenatal screening where we're looking for little bits of the DNA from the fetus within the mother's blood. And it was in fact that there were three cases where the results were really weird and the scientists were looking at that and in all three cases the women had cancer. And they're going, oh my god, we can act, it's not only a fetus which is not part of the mother that we can spot these differences, but if there was a cancer then we'll see differences compared to the, the normal blood. So that's the, sort of the background. The, the evidence that we have now is that um, this test can pick up a very high proportion of people who we know have an advanced cancer. If you do the test yeah. after you've done the diagnosis, it will pop, pick it up. And it picks up about half of the early cancers too. So it's not perfect by any means. Um, but we think it should be able to pick up at least half of, of cancers. And then the part that's quite amazing about the test is that it only seems to test positive in about one in 200 people who don't have cancer. And that um, yeah, has been a big challenge for other screening tests that people, you know, 5% of the population test positive. But where could it go wrong? So first of all, if it tells somebody, we think you have cancer, we don't find the cancer. How anxious are they going to be? You know, why did this test tell me I, they think it has cancer? It's not like with symptoms where hopefully the doctor says, well, you know, I was a bit worried you might have cancer, but this is what caused those symptoms. There's a, a differential diagnosis. The, you know, the, hopefully your doctor will tell you why it is that you have been feeling unwell or, or what that lump was. Um, at the moment, we don't know what to say to the person. It's just, you had a positive test. It doesn't seem to be cancer, but we can't be completely certain that it's not such a small cancer that we haven't seen it yet. We, we don't know what's going on. So there could be a lot of anxiety. The big worry that you talked about with prostate cancer is less of a worry here because it's not great at picking up those really early cancers. For instance, screen detected breast cancers, this test is not good at picking up. So I don't think it's going to be doing a lot of overdiagnosis. But it may be that by the time there's little bits of cancer in the blood, it's too late to do any real good. And, you know, we've created anxiety and problems. So it may not work. I'm optimistic that it will work. And certainly, even if the test that we're looking at doesn't work, I think that within the next decade, you know, another test that's using similar technologies um, will work. But not everyone agrees with me, and we need uh, to make sure. the trial, indeed. So that is why I think we have to go through these uh, things. Now, I noticed both Claire and Dave wanted to jump in, but I thought this topic of behaviour was too good a hook not to bring in Saskia um, about this. And I think, Saskia, you've thought both about the behavioural response here, about what Claire would say is the constitution of the risk stratification, 
and of course these results. So talk us through the way you think about how patients respond and maybe a little bit about the clinicians as well. Yeah, thanks, Ian. I think one of the key things, I mean, people have really touched on it nicely already. You, we've already talked about you know, results can cause anxiety, results can affect people psychologically, people, but even before people get the results um, of uh, screening tests, or risk gratification tests, people have to make a decision about whether they want the test in the first place. So you've got an element of um, public acceptability, you've got an element of thinking about like, what does the public understand when they first hear about this test so that they can then make an informed choice. You know, it's, an info it's a personal choice as to whether you have a screening test or not. And what does that mean? That means that you have to have the right amount of information for you to make a decision that's consistent with your values. And that then, that then and your, and that is reasonably informed um, by high quality information that then enables you to make a, to act and to uh, engage in a behavior. So the first behavior is actually, do you have the screening test or not? Now, if what you think is that if, if the screening test does um, lead to benefits, then one of the things we need to consider is that then you've got the possibility of social inequalities, um, that if people differentially take up the test, then it's really important that we make sure that um, people, that we don't have these disparities in uptake. And we do see disparities in uptake. And so just in terms of thinking about the benefits, these are ultimately, it only benefits people if people A, show up, and have the and have the screening in the first place and then b are able to act on it to reduce the the risk in the case of risk stratification or to address the early cancer um, in the case of screening when it comes then to um, you've then got psychology and behavior coming in in terms of the communication of the result so here again it becomes really important like if the clinician or the person providing the result doesn't actually fully understand the result um, itself which is not impossible especially with these new emerging technologies then that can obviously lead to obviously lack of comprehension in the provider of the information obviously then leads um, potentially to lack of comprehension and confusion in the patient and that is where that comprehension in that lack of comprehension is a problem in itself and it's also a problem because it's going to not it's going to um, uh, be less likely to lead obviously to appropriate risk reducing interventions, behaviours and actually lead to this anxiety and uncertainty that we've um, talked about. And finally, once you've had that result, um, obviously I alluded to this already, it's really what happens next that's important. And what happens next is that the patient or the individual receiving the result has to act. It's not, it's not something that's done to them. You don't do the surgery to them. You don't deliver an intervention to them. It's something that they are then offered by the clinician or the public health service and then have to, they have to actually act themselves um, to take up that offer. So you can see how psycho the, the psychological considerations and behavioral considerations act all the way through this sort of pipeline, if you like, or all the way through the, the journey. And that's why it's sort of so important that we think about both the sort of discovery research, all of this super important research that we've been hearing about today, um, about the, the tests and the so on of themselves, but we've got to then really pay attention as well to the translation of those, those tests and the results um, uh, into a, a service, into a um, uh, into service for patients and, and the public. So it's that translational aspect, it's looking at how you then implement the tests and in the, the screening um, in the healthcare system yeah. and really carefully measure what is actually happening with patients and the public um, psychologically and behaviorally. And I'm, I know Claire and Dave, you have got some things to come back into these, these new trials, but I, I wanna loop straight back to Peter and say, you know, uh, is this part of, well, how, to what extent are these aspects on anxiety, which you mentioned was one of the reasons that things could go wrong, is that part of the trial? Are you going to, do you, uh, do you know how you're going to measure that? I, I, it's fascinating. I should have uh, sort of swatted up beforehand uh, to know what your trial design was. So yes and no. Um, so first of all, Saskia also mentioned uh, inequalities. So we can't, uh, if we treated everyone equally, we probably would see that it would lead to greater inequalities, that we would get fewer people from more deprived backgrounds 
participating. So we are trying to achieve equity rather than equality, and we are over inviting people. Um, and we have a, a dynamic program in, in terms of who we invite to ensure that we get um, a full range of um, across the sort of deprivation in society or social class, uh, a full age distribution. Um, so otherwise we would be getting fewer older people than we'd want. Um, and that seems to be working very well, that uh, program. So that we have definitely uh, want to ensure that this study is representative of the population of England. The, in terms of understanding um, the behavioral aspects and the anxiety, um, we have a team led by um, Joe Waller, who's a behavioral scientist who Suske knows very well, um, who's, who's focusing on that. One of the problems we have is that because of the design of the study, so I always feel it's, it's important to find out whether there are benefits before you really get into the details of how are you going to implement it and how will it work in society. The problem is that if there is a benefit and we know exactly what it is and once we know exactly what the harms are, then we can give people the right information. At the moment, there's quite a lot that's unknown. I can't tell people, you know, don't worry because we know this is a really good test and if you do this, you're going to reduce your risk of dying from cancer and that it's only really rare that it gets the answer right because until we do the trial, we don't know that. So there's a little bit of chicken and egg, that, well, not chicken and egg, but um, you, yep. you can't tell people what you would want to in the communication in order to minimise anxiety because I don't know that's the truth. Um, and But also because of the way we're doing the trial, people don't know they've had a negative test result. So people who have a positive test result, they definitely know that's what's happened. The others, they don't know whether they're in the control arm. So this is a randomized controlled trial. Half the people uh, are not being tested. They're giving a blood sample and that's being stored. Um, and half the people are being tested. And so we're not telling somebody, we tell them, you, know, you don't have to wait for your result anymore. Now that means we can't see whether there's a change in behavior associated with being told you don't have a test result, your, your test is negative. And there's a little worry that people, for instance, wouldn't partake in other screening programs. Um, you know, some people think, oh, they'll probably start smoking because they think they're at low risk of cancer. I don't think that's at all likely, um, but it is possible that they would sort of get overly confident and not go to the GP as no. promptly if they got symptoms thinking, ah, oh, so what, well, I'm just going to ping pong back to Saskia, but I do know I've got two planes circling Heathrow, um, well, or Peter rather. So Saskia, the, uh, you, 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 I, I felt that you wanted to, to come in on the point there that Peter was making. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the point that Peter made about um, uncertainty. Um, uh, so I think Debbie Spiegelwalter um, speaks very um, uh, eloquently about this as well. That obviously one of the big things in medicine, in public health, um, and in the world generally is the concept of risk and public understanding of risk. And actually, as you sort of pointed out, actually um, clinicians understanding of, of risk. And I think it's this is a really big area that how you risk communication, how you communicate risk, whether it's risk stratification or risk arising from uh, you know, new um, types of screening with personal disease risk. Um, that risk communication, how you do that well, both in written format, graphical format and verbally in a shared decision making context with a, between a patient and a healthcare professional, all of that is really, really important. The thing that's happening at the moment, of course, and, and actually it was always there, but it's just sort of risen to the surface much more, is the uncertainty around the risk. And actually what's, what we're starting to focus on much more now is communication around about uncertainty as well as communication about risk and I think that's one of the things that we all everyone sort of is is sort of on this journey of having to get much more comfortable with the fact that it's no longer um, a sort of a definitive yes or no do I have cancer or not even and Peter's also alluded to it really nicely we've even now this concept of pre-cancer is going to be something new as well for public understanding of of a cancer and relationship with how they think about cancer this it you know this is um I think this is going to be a big important emerging factor um, over the, the the next few years and how we do this well. Okay, great. Now, Dave, Claire, I know you're going to come in as well. So, Dave, I felt that you also wanted to to give some commentary here about these new technologies for screening and these things. Yes. Yeah, 
Yes, yes. Yeah. So um, the, there are there are several um, blood tests for cancer under development. Uh, various you know, different companies and, and uh, things arising from from the universities, from academia. And as Peter mentioned, you know, it's not just blood. There are breath tests. There are um, urine tests, and so on. Um, so I think there's two points that I wanted to make. One being um, harking back to something Peter mentioned about, um, you know, understanding the the cancers that we're finding, and we touched on, you know, finding inconsequential cancers previously. It doesn't look like that's will be the problem with with the um, the blood tests because they do appear to be detecting kind of advanced or aggressive cancers. But the interesting thing, what we don't yet know, is is there something different about the types of cancers that these blood tests find? So if the blood tests are based on the cancers shedding DNA, uh, you know, breaking down, they're more unstable, they're shedding DNA into the blood. Are cancers that shed DNA into the blood inherently more aggressive and unstable? And therefore, even if you find them, are these the kind of cancers that it's not you're not really doing early detection because the uh, chances are they might already have spread in which case you, you're sort of doing late detection and are you actually going to make a dent in survival by finding them um and that i think is a, is a is an unknown and is exactly the reason you know peter is doing his very well designed uh, trial to find oh, yeah. out yeah so so it's it's uh it's, i'm not saying that uh, you know they won't help but it's a uh, it's a question about okay. yet but this as you say this goes to i mean i think the only way to really know these things is to do it in a trial absolutely you know, yeah, it, yeah. No, there is no there is no magic at some that's level right that's right go. and then the, the other thing that i wanted to mention was um looking at looking for cancers based on uh mutations um in the dna that look like cancer um is an attractive and very sensible way of going about it the but is um there's an increasing amount of evidence that uh, very normal tissues, you know, very yeah, healthy absolutely. normal tissues throughout your body are rife with mutations in your DNA that look like they should cause cancer. So, you know, there's cells in your, in your skin, in your eyelids, in the lining of your esophagus uh, that are sort of peppered with mutations that would, you know, classically are strongly identified as being cancer causing mutations. And yet those cells are perfectly healthy. Well, so, and 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 there's this. I mean, again, I'm I'm not an expert here, but Barrett's esophagus and and these sorts of precancerous lesions or whatever however we describe them, it, it is a bit of a continuum with aging as well, right? That's that's kind of what you're pointing out. Is that correct, Dave? Is that fair? yeah, yeah? Oh, certainly. I mean, certainly those those mutations accumulate with aging, but they can occur earlier in life also. Oh, okay. um, but it's you know, it's, it's simply you know, if I had a infinitely sensitive uh, blood test that picked up those mutations yeah everybody yeah. would be hot everybody would be hot at some level right yeah? exactly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, and i think i mean i'd like i'd like some reflections here and i know on the imaging side that gets to this incidental omers right where you put people in a good enough scanner and that goes to your thyroid example um we've all got cancer the question is is are, are our bodies on top of this particular cancer at this particular time but of course the cards might break in 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 favor for this as a method to assess it not not against it as it were it could be that that the da the most dangerous cancers do in fact shed in this particular way um claire you've been very patient uh what what what, what triggered you in uh, peter's description of the technology um there were probably just a, a, f a few points to come back on um, and it is fantastic technology. It's amazing that we can detect tumor mutations at, at that concentration in blood with that level of sensitivity and specificity. It is an absolute technological triumph. And it's a good example of a, a technology, a test that we've used really effectively in monitoring for cancer recurrence. Um, yeah. So it's widely used, particularly in lung cancer, fantastic you don't have to biopsy them you can see emergent resistant mutations absolutely wonderful and then looking at what happens if you move it upstream and apply it in the general population and that's when obviously your um, prior probability kicks in um, and as David said earlier if you're going to apply this screening to a population of people aged 50 to 60 the, the likelihood of any of them having cancer this year is, yeah. is really very, very low. 
and so you have that the characteristics of a, the specificity and sensitivity are inherent to the test you're doing but the positive predictive value is inherent to the population to whom you're applying it so that one in 200 yeah it doesn't sound so good when you multiply it up huh? well yeah that yeah. that that's false positive rate against your true positive rate starts becoming potentially quite a problem and particularly I don't know what monitoring you are going to need to carry on doing to those people who have got a false positive, but that in itself is quite a question. If if you've told me I have bowel cancer and you can't find it, I probably want quite a lot of scans and colonoscopies like every week forever because you have told me there's cancer in my blood. I think I think these are, and I, and I'm statistical and medical, but that's that's my intuitive response. To yeah. that information there's just a couple of other points i was just gonna say um as well i mean that the published data do show that the the gallery test as stands is pretty sensitive for stage three and four cancers that have presented symptomatically yeah. um and those are even different to ones that haven't presented symptomatically as it were so I, I think as previously stated, you know, the, the purpose of screening and, and for all of these discussions, I would point you back to the classic Wilson Jugner 1968 criteria of what makes a good screening test. You have to know the natural history of the disease. You have to have an early stage. You have to have a proven thing you can do to people with the early stage that changes the outcome of that disease. And there's various others, you, you know, that and, and a, a solid confirmatory test. So you, these are really kind of useful basic things to go back to. Um, and if your test is not diagnosing something early, such that you change the outcome, then then that that is not going to be effective as a screening test. So I don't what I don't think we should do here is try and critique and and I have Peter answer each one of these things. Because what I think is going to be more interesting here, and we're about to get to some questions coming up, is is actually, again, kind of risks, opportunities and risks about new technologies and how we think about it um, uh, here. And, and it's very obvious to me that, that a very important part of this is understanding, being rigorous and testing this. And so that, that the, the kind of meta thing, which is, We've got an opportunity. We're actually going through a rigorous test. We can now argue about whether it's too fast or too slow, perhaps, but no, probably not um, uh, uh, that way. But the general structure, I think, is in the right direction. Peter, do you want to add anything? I don't. I don't want this to turn you into know, a kind no, of no, a, it, it was, a, a peer review moment on the gallery. No, so, I, so this is just something on what David said, which I think that when he was talking about. Um, yeah, it may be that the the cancers that are screen detected are harder to treat. Yeah. But actually, um, there could be a, a beneficial be, yeah, yeah, that really it. drive research to get new treatments for those. And it could also mean that what would appear to be a um, an early cancer that you would say, this is all the treatment you would use. You now think, well, let's do a trial. We can treat this cancer more aggressively. And so we may be able to improve the, the survival. So I actually think that even if things don't work here in this trial, if we see that it's leading to getting cancers earlier, but you're not getting the benefits you would have expected, that will lead to new research to either treat those earlier cancers more aggressively if they are positive on this test. Even if you don't use it as a screening test, you might use it post diagnosis to as a prognostic test to say who needs or to get a better understanding and new treatments that are taking into account well why is it that these cancers are shedding DNA into the blood so I think in terms of the whole research agenda there's a lot of reasons to yes. be optimistic even if this trial doesn't work or even if you think I've got the wrong design for this trial yeah but but there's also this other option which is kind of what we it might be the case that kind of everybody's hot. I mean, you don't think so. You say it's one in 200, it kind of can't be if you've done enough controls. But but um, but I do, you know, I'm, I'm always struck by this conversation that we use these phrases like true positive and false positive. And, and our minds rush to the idea that, that the measurement was wrong. And I'm not sure that it's really the measurement was wrong. It was that 
our understanding of what is going on in the body was wrong. And these things which we label as cancers are, you know, better labeled as something else. And that, that would go to the, the prostate story. And, and there's some nods there. And we, we've kind of established that. Dave, do you want to come in there a little bit? And then I find, but before I do that, I've got one wonderful question coming in, which I'll read out in a moment from Anne Pierre. Um, and please um, add more and I will start to, to feed your comments in to this conversation. But over to Dave. Um, yeah, so uh, I uh, agree with, with, with what Peter was saying. I think that um, fundamentally I'm, I'm an optimist uh, and I think that while we absolutely have to be on the ball with all of these potential risks that we've talked about, um, I, I really believe that um, there are only really two, two problems to crack and one's an engineering problem. I, uh, if you can get your test uh, you know, perfectly um, specific so that you don't have any you know, technical measurement error of false positives, then the only remaining problem is one of biological understanding. Um, so it's, you know, fi finding a thing fundamentally is good as long as you can deduce what that thing is. Yeah. So, so if you can understand its biology and if you can accurately say, this thing is fine, you do not need to worry about it, off you go. Great, I'm happy. Or <laughs> biologically, this thing is a, is a real risk and we need to intervene at this level or at this level of aggressiveness if it's a worse looking one. Um, that, that I think is, is a big part of the problem, a, a big part of the picture. And, and exactly as Peter says, if we're doing these trials, we're finding these lesions, we can, un we can then do the biology and understand them. You know, that's the right path to, to be on. Well, I think that's great. I'm, I'm smiling at the, the life is very simple, just perfect engineering and perfect biological understanding. Simple as that. Oh, you know, you know, what, what, what can go wrong from that? Right. Let me go to the questions. So Ampere says, what would the, be the indications for early cancer screening, mutation screening in the blood? When would the benefits supersede the risks of running blood tests in which patient groups? Also wondering about this information, cancer risk level being available for potential to health insurers and how that could be detrimental to patient health plans. That is collateral damage. So it's, it's an intro, I think there's two things. We, we covered some of that first bit in some of these discussions here. I know, I'm here, I hope, there may be something else in that first question, but I think that second rather complicated question, which is, again, this happened in HIV testing, right? When insurers said, have you ever even gone for an HIV test? And that was a, that's a slightly freaky uh, moment. So any comments on that? Saskia, I feel that you would be our, our best person, though Claire's got her hand up first. So Claire, why don't you go first and then Saskia, you can come in. I, mean, I can just speak to working as a clinical geneticist, but um, there's been a moratorium across the um, Association of British Insurers for at least the last 20 years that they do not ask, uh, you are not required to reveal and they're not allowed to ask about predictive genetic testing. So if there is a BRCA1 mutation in your family and you have a predictive test, you are not required to reveal that information. Uh, so that's the current state of play. Obviously, if you start getting into more polygenic complex polygenic risks and so forth they are a little bit more um uh, sort of non nondescript in terms of that type of information um but it, I, as currently we work within nhs genetics which is effectively sort of binary results for single gene outcomes there is there are good protections in this country however the states um is a good demonstration yeah. of the, ca the counterfactual did I get my, my little anecdote there about HIV testing right for this country back in the, the late 80s, early 90s on, on life insurance? Or was that an American thing? Pretty sure some insurers, life insurers, were asking for it. Have I got that right or wrong? <laughs> um, I, I think I remember hearing that as an American thing. Yeah. It's an American thing, not a British thing. Okay. Saskia, one, you yeah. educate us or educate me, let's put it that way. Well, no, I think just one. <laughs> I think there's one thing I can add to that is that um, uh, uh, that we have done research looking at people's attitudes and obviously 
you know, people are always very concerned about implications for insurance. It's the number one thing, whether you're talking about genetic testing for risk prediction, as Claire said, for BRCA and so on, or whether you're talking about the new polygenic risk scores or whole genome sequencing, or now the context of ctDNA um, testing for screening. It, it's obviously something that people always raise as a concern. I think exactly as Claire said, you know, we have a moratorium um, uh, and that means that health insurers can't ask for it. I think when people, people are sometimes reassured by that and sometimes people are, are not um, because obviously things can change you know that it may be like that today that's, there's no guarantee that um the say that will be the same thing tomorrow i think also it speaks to a question about genetic exceptionalism though as well because people you know this is this always comes up is that you know we actually you can be asked your family history um uh, which is actually speaking to your inherited genetic risk as well as your environmental and um other um social factors and you can be asked that on an insurance form but not but then it's understandably we we sort of exclude these sort of rare genetic um, tests um, now, but there's always that sort of discussion around, you know, what is the rationale for making exception? And that's going to become more and more the case um, as we move more and more towards um, multifactorial um, risk assessment and tests. Um, yeah. Okay. And can, can I just ask, Saskia, do you know whether, what, what are the rules about screening? I, I mean, presumably, I mean, obviously people ask for life insurance and for health insurance, whether you have had a cancer diagnosis. Do, do people have to, to what, to what extent do, do, do people get asked about optional, I, I don't know how much of there is optional screening programs. I simply don't know. Uh, I'm gonna look at Peter. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Peter, do you know? So, so I was gonna say we should distinguish between the sort of risk prediction and the screening. Yeah. Um, in America, there are definitely places where you can get reduced insurance if you go for screening. It would also clearly not be fair to say that you could suddenly take out screening after you've had a positive screening test result. If that test result meant you were 50-50, whether you've got cancer and say, well, I don't know, I haven't had a diagnosis yet. I want to get my insurance, top-notch insurance, just in case. Um, so I assume it would be quite reasonable to say there's an exclusion if you've had a positive test until that's resolved. But having these screening tests wouldn't tell you about your future risk of cancer. It's only telling you about your current risk of cancer. And therefore, yeah. once you've been through that process, I don't think it should be affecting um, the policy negatively. And you know, it could be, they could say, presumably, actually, we think this is good. If you take part in this, it's going to cost us less. Therefore, you know, you can have a reduced premium if you go for screening regularly. Okay, well, now Ampere has joined us on the screen by some piece of Zoom magic. Um, and uh, Ampere, uh, yeah, it's perfect. Why don't you just clarify um, uh, uh, the question, uh, especially the first bit, if you want to all come in on this. Now, I just keep just talking about the insurance because it's interesting in the sense that, say, I'm doing this risk, you know, sort of risk assessment or I don't know how you call it because it's not screening or sometimes it could be borderline. But so I have a risk um, X of whatever cancer, therefore, I'm, see, I'm worried. So I'm going to see a specialist. So if I'm going to see a specialist, this is going to be already, this is going to be my record. So why do you go, how do you justify? So, you, you know, it's, it's going to be known. So in France, it's, you know, it's social security um, 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 system and it's covered for. But I'm thinking in some countries where, you know, um, it will be, even if you don't have to actually give that report, you will go and see a specialist. And you want to investigate so automatically you're being flagged as having mm -hmm. that and it might be it's just oh you know it's, it was just a scare but it's still in your record and i don't know the long-term implication of you know how that would be it could be it could lead some exclusion i just i'm not saying it's a bad thing i'm just wondering how to structure this or you know because it could be that you know, the best is um, le mieux l'ennemi du bien. So basically, when you're trying to do it perfect, you do it actually. It's detrimental. You know, you're trying yeah. to be like. Super so I mean, I mean, so what? What I think I, I'm pretty sure everybody would agree here that that 
one has to always think through these system effects and this is why these conversations are so useful and and so exact you know so so important to have and those system effects affect patients they affect um uh we'll come on to this they affect family members as well that's another interaction that we have in the system but this interaction between health insurance and life insurance and of course Although human biology is the same worldwide, pretty much, you know, I mean, the, you know the, all these processes are pretty much the same. How humans have constructed their healthcare systems is, can be really quite different. And so there you could have quite a different set, of, a, set, set of questions in America to the UK, to France, to Germany, uh, depending how, on how that's structured. So, And I, I think it's also sort of, Try to encourage people like, you know, the earlier, the better. But then, you know, sometimes people don't want to know as well. Yeah, well, like, this, I mean, a lot of people here, don't want to know. And, know. Then, yeah. and, and then some people might want to know, but they might not realize the, um, the uh, consequences in terms of, of their health insurance or maybe um, the, uh, their, their potential for being hired, you know, impacts that could be about work. Oh, but this, and then... This. And this no. is, I think this people, it's not just do it and then you'll just be better off. I'm not sure people might understand the implications on their life, just no. trying to figure out. And I'll just, and then I'll just leave the floor. I'm, I'll just move on. But I just, there's something I found really interesting. There was this, I can't remember the company. I think it may be something to do one, two, three. You know about Ancestry. You look for your... 23 your, you and me, this, yeah. 23 yeah. and me, yeah. Lots of different sort of um, anecdotal drama around this that people send that and they get some results back and that information is not, I mean, there's a sense also of the company has data about you and how that works. And this is just shows that it could have like ripple effect in a dramatic way and how we handle this. I don't have the answer for it, but um, I don't so know. I think you bring, you bring up a great point. Um, if Elizabeth or whoever does the magic, and Pierre, thank you so much. And what I'm going to do here is ask Saskia to talk a little bit to that question of, again, I think picking up this question, you know, should everyone, should we insist that everybody has screening? That seems wrong. And you talked about the entire journey of a person yeah. through screening. And then maybe can we bring Sophie to the, um, uh, to the floor as well? Um, because I think she'll come in with some good comments from that from there. But Saskia, talk us about how you think about and maybe we should think about that that option for screening, as it were. Yeah, I mean, I think we have that basic principle of autonomy and that it's people's right to make a personal choice about whether they want to do it or, or not. And I think it's the imperative is ensuring that high quality information that's pitched in the right way, that's tailored and targeted to the, audio, to the different communities, different audiences, is available in a way that's accessible, that makes it possible for people to make an informed choice and a valid choice that's right for, for them. All you can do, I think it, it, it you sort of it's super important, therefore, that the, the, the communication part of this um, is done really, really well right from the beginning. And actually, it's, you know, it is a, it's a, it's a sort of an ethical imperative that you, you make sure that people have the right information and are supported in the right way at the beginning to make an informed choice on its own. But actually, part of the reason that that's important is because that is what um, helps avoid the negative consequences at the other end because when yeah. we worry about anxiety we worry about lack of comprehension uh, we worry about inappropriate behavioral responses we worry about false reassurance in response to low results and so on if you're doing a good job of communicating and ensuring comprehension and so on at the beginning you're actually much more likely um, to have the sort of positive adaptive risk reducing behaviors at the other end the one thing i just also wanted to add to that is the other consideration here is when you do get the results then we've talked a little bit about um, peter mentioned the false reassurance in response to the the results we've heard a lot about this over the years in the context of whole genome sequencing more broadly um, and and actually the, this is why i think it's just so important that you not only ensure the communication is good but you also measure the outcomes of that communication because we cannot find any empirical evidence that if you tell people that they 
don't have a, a certain uh, high risk or something hasn't been found. There just isn't any evidence to suggest that they all throw their hands up in the air and go, well, I will eat the donuts, I will smoke as much as I want and so on. There's no evidence of that. And that's why I think it's really important that we have the data and the empirical evidence and attention to the behavioral impact um, as well as all these other things. I, yeah, Dave, yeah. come in. Yeah, sorry, Peter mentioned um, about, you know, whether, uh, you know, a, a blood test that said you're fine would lead people to abandoning the um, recommended cancer screening programs. Uh, and I think in one of the studies of, of one of the other blood tests that they conducted in the States, um, they found that wasn't the case, that, that people's adherence to, uh, you know, breast uh, mammography and colorectal screening and whatnot remained the same, even when they had uh, the blood test. Okay, that's and this again goes to being data driven about this. So it's great, Sophie, that by the magic of Zoom, you've been teleported into the same uh, uh, setup, and you've got some questions here about um, family members and and how this works here, as well as a little bit of travel insurance uh, as well. But let's start with the family members, Sophie. Um, the floor's yours. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, I represent myelodysplastic syndromes here, and uh, it was known, or to start off with, because it's still a fairly young um, uh, disease, um, that MDS is not hereditary. Uh, mm -hmm. That's always what's been drilled into all of us and so on. And um, in the last few years, um, it's emerging that, well, it's not quite like that. And uh, there's more and more research to be done in, in, in familial M MDS. And uh, it was also thought that, well, maybe it's the environment that you live in. That's why more than one person in each family develops MDS, mm -hmm. but it's not quite the case. And there's more and more um, situations where you, you have um, two or three generations affected um, by it, or they have leukemia and then MDS and so on. And then there's uh, the, the advent also of uh, what you, you guys are actually talking about is these pre MDS or um, uh, mutations. So the, the chip, the CCUS, the ICUS um, that are very recent. And uh, we have seen where um, a hematologist may have um, uh, spotted those mutations and told a patient uh, and they were destroyed by, by that news because as Claire, I think you said with prostate or whatever it was, you'd want to you you know people would want to test all of the time to make sure it doesn't progress and so on so there's that um but just to come back to the family history um it's it's not a well-known type of blood cancer for a start but then those who've been exposed to it know exactly what it's like and how few uh, treatment options there are for it and um because uh, it's still not really known as a hereditary thing. People do ask the question and it's very ambivalent. It's like, how do you deal with that? Do you, yeah. those family members who've seen their relatives die of MDS will be highly um, alarmed. Yeah, yeah. So Sophie, I think that's great. And I think we're very lucky to have here on, a, on, a, on the panel uh, Claire, who who I think really lives this world in a, in a variety of ways as a practicing clinical geneticist who, who has to talk to patients. And it is very complicated, Claire, right? Talk us through how you think about this and, and the great, you know, the clear cut areas are perhaps easier. It's the gray areas which are hard here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and as Sophie sort of well articulates, um, our knowledge and, uh, and therefore the information we can give patients has changed over time. Um, but certainly for most cancer types, and that would include MDS, AML spectrum, there is some manner of increased risk to family members. And I, for most common cancers, breast, uh, prostate, colorectal, it's a two to three fold risk. That's quite typical. So that's across the board. So if you have a first degree relative affected with a particular cancer, you are at a modestly increased risk of getting it. Um, and there are a number of reasons underpinning that. It can be that there is a, a shared environmental factor that would cause you to be at increased risk. We think that's probably less 
we used to call it a kind of household factor, something that is, you know, and, it, and that can actually include um, sort of childhood um, factors and they do lots of studies around um, factors in pregnancy. So it can be anything that is common between you and your siblings or household members. There's then high penetrance genes, and I always use uh, BRCA1 and 2 as examples, that these are pretty infrequent, but if you have it, you're at very, very high risk of getting the cancer that, that is in a family member. And that accounts for a, a small proportion of familial clusters, but actually that's relatively uncommon. And the third factor is then this so-called polygenic risk that, that we have um, hundreds, if not thousands, of common variants which which form an additive risk and therefore I share some of these with my sister and, she, and if I if I have a high higher than average burden she probably has a slightly higher than average burden and it, it's these shared polygenic risk factors between siblings confers that third part of risk but actually in terms of so so we can test you and there are a handful of incredibly rare um, single gene uh, causes of inherited AML and MDS, but they account for handfuls of families across the country. And then otherwise, we can only just give you these numerical likelihoods that, you know, you, you are, you know, two, three, fourfold risk on account of uh, um, a sibling being affected. That's all we can really tell you. Can we screen? Well, we don't really know if doing regular blood counts is a good thing or a bad thing, whether we're actually finding early chip that is actually just a sign of aging it's not a sign that of mds that's going to progress so again we, we there's lots of sort of ad hoc screening we put in place for family members who we think are at elevated risk but actually we, we haven't shown ruthlessly that it, it adheres to the the wilson criteria i.e that it's actually catching things early and changing the outcome now uh, claire when there's a patient in front of you, do you get into the Wilson criteria and this this risk? Uh, you know, there's a. I feel that I feel there is almost a different Claire uh, for the patients, perhaps when you go through that. How do you how do you navigate the conversation for somebody who is worried about what in practice they say to their family members, or what in practice if they're you know, you know, I, I just think there's a very interesting business which goes to the practical end of Saskia's communication of risk and I'm just interested uh, um, how you deal with that. I mean I, I sometimes it's very useful to talk in absolute risk not relative risk right so if you're at you know if you have a close relative with pancreatic cancer and you, you are therefore at two or three fold risk that sounds quite scary and pancreatic cancer is, is, is a very unpleasant aggressive disease but actually your, the, the lifetime risk for anyone is only one in 50. So even if you increase that, your 2% your risk may go up to a 4% risk or a 6% risk. And sometimes that is, that is helpful to talk in numbers. And I also talk in the cheerful numbers that actually um, one in two of us, you know, your next door neighbor has a one in two chance of developing cancer. So you have seen some cards that you know that you're a slightly higher risk of developing a particular type of cancer. And actually, that's useful to, to have that information because it, it may allow you to be, you know, look out a for warning signs. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes, uh, you know, contextualizing it against other risks is also helpful. Yeah. Now, I, I realise that we're slightly running over, I think, and uh, I think we'll definitely take um, one more question. Uh, Peter, you wanted to come in and I'm going to read out one more. So, Peter? I was just wondering, Claire, whether you ever frame it the other way and saying you've got a 95% a chance of not getting pancreatic cancer. Um, yes, exactly. I mean, I think that's sometimes, you know, helpful. And people are actually often worried about that when we talk about genetics. They're often worried about their children or grandchildren and their likelihood of inheriting something. And actually, if you start breaking it down and then put it, you know, I like to put it against the risk of, you know, war in the Middle East and Ebola and other things that actually, if you start getting into this 50 percent to 50 percent to 50 percent um, and, and these relatively modest risks that w we sometimes give all these numbers. And that is scary in itself because you're talking about something bad. But actually, it's not it's not a very high absolute risk of that bad thing yeah. in, in the general background of everything that goes on that people haven't been pre-warned about. Yeah. 
So you're so that, that, to terrify people about all the other ways they might die. Well, I think actually in, in and there's a lot about, you know, I was on something earlier today about um, e-consultation and bot chats for, you know, consultation. I think there's a lot to be said for reading the room and how, how you interact with people and actually just trying to get a sense of you know what what is helpful you know whether it's talking really detailed numbers or whether it's contextualizing or whether it's reassure you know you know sort of, yeah yeah exactly and I, I think there there is a lot around that sort of that that consultation okay. right I'm going to do the last question um but I for me this has been fascinating like I'd just like to repeat at the top that I'm not a cancer biologist so I have like increased my understanding of cancer screening by a factor of a million um, uh, over there. So from uh, Joanna Janus, uh, all the people who have a positive result will have to have follow-up tests to determine if they have cancer. Are there concerns about how NHS will cope with this? In this trial of the future extended, if we are struggling to cope with timely diagnosis now? Again, a very relevant systems question here. And um, again, let's not get into the details of the trial, but let's ask the question, you know, this is, you know, uh, would we benefit if there was good early diagnosis? Um, uh, you know, would the NHS get overwhelmed or would it be a good thing? Dave, I suspect you have a good view on this uh, as well as yeah. others. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question and it's a very real challenge. Um, you know, particularly during COVID, we, we've seen um, our ability to uh, appropriately, you know, refer people and, 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 and put them into the right diagnostic pathways impeded. Um, and we must be mindful that yes, if you if you introduce a new screening system that is going to refer a ton of people for a diagnostic follow up. So you know, your blood test picks up a load of people. Those people, all, as Peter says, need to go for a scan or a biopsy or what have you. That does put pressure on the system. Um, what? So on on the, so that's yes, a risk. Uh, what I suppose we need to be mindful of is that the system itself doesn't stand still. Um, and that you know, uh, technologies and advancements are introduced which help us get better at uh, triaging and managing the patients who have been referred. So there's, there's a really good example of um, a technology you may have heard of called the cytosponge, yeah. uh, which is something that was innovated out of Cambridge University. Uh, supported, I hasten to add, by Cancer Research UK. <laughs> um, so uh, it, this is basically a, a kind of um, capsule on a string that you swallow and when you swallow it it uh, puffs out a little sponge that's drawn back out and the sponge samples the cells in the esophagus and that is a good way of uh, finding esophageal cancer but also a good way of um, looking at a precursor condition called Barrett's esophagus. Um, normally if people are at risk of esophageal cancer if they have this uh, Barrett's condition then, then they would be uh, referred for an endoscopy and an endoscopy is, you know, a camera on a, a tube down your gullet. And uh, that is expensive and it's time consuming. And the, the health system has a finite capacity for the number of endoscopies yeah. it can possibly do. So bringing the cytosponge in, suddenly you've got a new, cheap, quick, easy way of um, monitoring those people with Barrett's esophagus uh, that doesn't require all these regular endoscopies. So, you know, that is an advancement that is helping to deal with that problem of um, more referrals from the people picked up by screen. And, and of course, the whole point, if this works, that, that higher referrals, you know, the people, if you're really bringing the diagnosis forward, those people would turn up somewhere in the system later on. I mean, I mean, you, that's you, exactly you, right. Yeah, the, yeah sort of... you're not. Um, yes, yeah, you're not. You're not uh, uh, picking people up who would never um, turn up in the health system anyway. I mean, yeah. So and, this... and, and actually, if you if you're getting them earlier in their disease course through the screening, then um, the amount of treatment and monitoring they require is often less. So yeah. it, it is it's possible but, that, that actually reduces the burden on the system. So th this goes to the kind of overdiagnosis and and the and the follow up screening things. Peter, you've been trying to jump in there. Yeah, no, it's a, yeah, it is an issue, um, and we haven't really dealt with it successfully in bowel screening. So we would like to be able to refer more people for colonoscopy, and we've artificially put the threshold of what a positive test is high, in order to be able to cope with the lack of colonoscopy capacity in, in the UK. Yeah. Um, but 
currently probably only about one in 20, certainly less, fewer than one in 10 people who are investigated for suspected cancer have cancer. And this screening test is, we are hoping that it will be more like one in two. So the proportion of people who you're going to investigate who will have cancer, if this all works, will be greater than we do currently. Um, so yes, this would increase workloads and we'd have to think about how that's managed. But the idea would be that other people who currently have fairly low risk of cancer and get these investigations, maybe you could save things there. I'm also optimistic that improvements in AI will mean that actually we don't have to have so many highly trained humans looking at images, looking at um, biopsies down a microscope, um, reading CT scans, and that should enable us to increase our capacity to do some of these further investigations. Yeah, so I, I I think, could, yeah. Both of those, as someone who, who kind of sees both sides of that, I, I worry, I worry that we're going to end up with, uh, you know, algorithms that are not so generalizable and these things, these are big questions. But I'm actually reassured by a colleague of mine, a radiographer, who, who uh, stood up uh, uh, to a conference of radiographers and says there's going to be two types of radiographers in the future. Radiographers who use AI and retired radiographers. And uh, I thought that was quite a good way of framing the, the, the future there. Um, now, we have finished. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. There are more or uh, uh, there are more um, consilium events uh, to, to see. And right at the end, I'd just like to thank again, these four expert panelists who just have really illuminated this whole area. So thank you so much for giving up your time for this. And